previous discussion, we saw that machine learning models need to be provided information about data points in the form of features. These are usually ordered lists of numbers called vectors. Today, we will learn more about working with objects such as vectors and arrays and also refresh some of our high school geometry basics. My beautiful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning and let's get started. Although it is simple to think of vectors as ordered lists of numbers or an array, their visual representation as objects in a vector space is equally appealing. The values in the various coordinates of a vector tell us how much we should move along each coordinate axis to get to the point denoted by that vector. It does not matter in which order we traverse the coordinates. There are lots of operations that can be done with a vector. For example, multiplying a vector with a real number, which we call a scalar, can stretch or shrink or flip that vector. To get that scaled vector, we simply multiply the scalar with each coordinate of the vector. Note that a negative sign in the scalar will flip the vector. Similarly, if the magnitude of the scalar is less than 1, it will shrink the vector and if it is greater than 1, then it will stretch the vector. Adding two vectors together simply gives us another vector whose coordinate values are the sum of the coordinate values of the two vectors being added. However, notice that this operation makes sense only if the two vectors have the same number of coordinates or as mathematicians say, have the same number of dimensions or the same dimensionality. Adding a 2D vector to a 3D vector directly does not make a lot of sense. However, there is also a nice visual representation of this addition process that is in the form of completing the parallelogram formed by the two vectors. Now, if you want to subtract a vector from another vector, let's say u minus v, what we can simply do is add u to minus v. Means that we first flip the vector v and then we add it to u. Notice that this new vector u minus v, when shifted properly, will start at the vector v and end at the vector u. The same trick works when taking more fancy combinations of the two vectors. First, scale or flip the two vectors appropriately. And then we simply use the parallelogram law or the coordinate wise addition law to add them. Now, this Parallelogram trick might get messy if you want to use it to visualize what happens when adding say 100 vectors in 10 dimensions. However, the coordinate wise method of adding vectors works beautifully with as many vectors you want to add no matter what the dimensionality, so long as all the vectors have the same dimensionality. In several machine learning applications, we will need to measure the length of our feature vectors. There are several ways to do this. The most common being the Euclidean length, which simply uses the Pythagoras' theorem to calculate the length of a vector. Note that this works in all dimensions. However, there are other ways to measure the length of a vector too. For example, the Manhattan or taxi cab length of a vector simply counts how much length in total do we need to move along the coordinates to get to the point denoted by the vector. This length has this funny name probably due to the fact that this is exactly the amount of distance a taxi or a car would have to travel if going from the origin to the point along roads that are arranged in a grid, as is the case with the borough of Manhattan in New York City. This notion of distance has another interesting property that it allows us to rearrange our moves along the various coordinates and so long as we keep moving towards our destination, and never overshoot or take a U-turn, we will get exactly the same Manhattan length. It's easy to extend this definition to higher dimensional vectors as well, simply by taking the sum of the absolute values of all the coordinates. Now it turns out that these notions of length, Euclidean length, taxi cab or Manhattan length, these are what are called norms. In fact, there's an entire family of so-called LP norms that are defined as follows. To find the pth 
norm of a vector, we take each coordinate of the vector, take its absolute value, raise it to the power p, add up all the values and take the pth root of the sum. Notice that if p equal to 2, we get the Euclidean length and if p equal to 1, we get the Manhattan length. Being able to measure the length of a vector immediately gives us the ability to measure distances. To measure the distance between the points denoted by the vectors say u and v, we simply find the difference vector and calculate its length. Note that this length could be measured using any of the norms we just saw, either Euclidean or Manhattan or something else. The fact that the difference vector can be seen as starting at one of the vectors and ending at the other means that by calculating the length of the difference vector, we are indeed calculating the distance between the two points. Now it turns out that these notions of distances that we get by calculating the norm of the difference vector are also called metrics. If we use the LP norm to calculate the distance between two vectors, we get what is called the LP metric. Uh, metrics are actually notions of distance that have three nice property. They have symmetry, which means the distance between a vector u and v is the same as the distance between the vector v and u. It satisfies identity, which means the distance of a vector from itself is zero. It also satisfies another interesting property called triangle inequality, which means that it's always shorter to directly go from one point to another than to go via a detour. From measuring lengths and distances, we now move on to measuring angles between two vectors. To help us do this, we need what is called the dot product. Given two vectors, their dot product is a real number, which could be positive or negative or even zero, that is found by simply multiplying the coordinate values and summing up these products. This trick works in any number of dimensions. Just like with vector addition, the dot product makes sense only if the two vectors are of the same dimensionality. However, the magical bit is that this weird looking number, the dot product, is somehow related to the angle between the two vectors. The dot product between two vectors is nothing but the Euclidean lengths of those two vectors multiplied together with the cosine of the angle between them. Since the lengths of a vector are never negative, this means that if two vectors are at an obtuse angle, then their dot product will be less than zero because the cosine of obtuse angles is less than zero. Similarly, if two vectors are at an acute angle, their dot product will be greater than zero because the cosine of acute angles is greater than zero. A special case arises when the two vectors in question are actually perpendicular to each other. In that case, their dot product turns out to be exactly zero. Now, in case you're wondering, why should the dot product of two vectors be linked to the angle between them? Let's see a very simple proof of this fact. Let us start with these two vectors u and v, which have coordinates x, y and p, q. And we will want to prove this claim. It would help us simplify the analysis if we first rotate the vectors so that one of them aligns with the coordinate axis. Let's say in this case, we rotate so that the vector v starts aligning with the coordinate axis. Note that this does not change the angle between the two vectors and you can trust me for now that this doesn't change the dot product between the two vectors either. Now obviously the rotation will change the vectors themselves. So the vector v will have a zero y coordinate now because it's along the x axis and its x coordinate value will simply be the length of the vector. Similarly, the vector u will have some new coordinates. Let's call them a and b. From here on, we simply calculate the dot product between the two vectors, calculate their lengths, also calculate the cosine of the angle between them by using the old high school trigonometry rule and notice that the claim indeed holds. Now note that although we presented this proof in two dimensions, it actually holds in any number of dimensions as well. Having done all this hard work to understand norms and metrics and dot products, I think we have earned the right to see some interesting applications of these concepts in machine learning. Let's start with norms. Norms can be used to define regions in space. Let's say this spherical ball centered at the point C with radius R. Note that which norm we use to define the ball can significantly alter what the ball looks like. So the ball looks like an actual ball if we use the Euclidean or L2 norm. But if we shift to a different norm, let's say the Manhattan or the L1 norm, then the supposed ball starts looking like a diamond instead. 
These balls are actually quite popular in machine learning in tasks such as anomaly detection. For example, if we have a lot of data points describing how a certain system, let's say an industrial boiler, works under normal conditions, each point being described by its feature vector, then we can find the smallest spherical ball that encloses all the data points. And there do exist algorithms to compute this minimum enclosing ball. Then we can use this as a model to perform anomaly or attack detection. So if we get a new data point, let's say describing how the boiler is working currently, we will describe it as normal if the data point lies within the ball and as anomalous or attack if it's lying outside the ball. Machine learning algorithms also make a lot of use of dot products. An example here is binary classification. One of the simplest models for binary classification is the linear model, which in two dimensions, which is the case here, looks exactly like a line. Y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope of the line and b is the intercept of the line. Note that we can actually rewrite this model in the form of w transpose x plus b, where w is now this two-dimensional vector and x is the two-dimensional vector, just encapsulating the two coordinates of the vectors. Now, changing the bias parameter of this model, that is b, does not change the slope of the line. It just changes the intercept. On the other hand, changing the w vector changes the slope of the line, but keeps the intercept unchanged. Now, if we get new data points for which we don't know the label, we can predict on these data points simply by looking at the sign of W transpose X plus B. If it's greater than zero, we can predict it as green, otherwise red. Note that this operation shades the entire space into red or green color. The two regions of spaces that we have just created, the red region and the green region, they are called half spaces. Linear models actually solve binary classification by dividing up the entire space into two half spaces, one for each one of the classes. Separating the two half spaces is usually a line or a hyperplane. The same procedure will work in higher dimensions as well. It's just that the vectors now will be higher dimensional. The bias term remains as it is. Note that the hyperplane itself, which means the set of points on which W transpose X plus B is equal to zero, is often called the decision boundary of this model. The vector W is the normal or perpendicular vector of this hyperplane. It's given this funny name because if we consider any two points on the hyperplane, let's say x and y, then w can be shown to be perpendicular to this difference vector. And this holds for all such difference vectors, which is why w is called the normal or perpendicular vector to the hyperplane. Similar to the 2D case, changing the bias parameter b simply shifts the hyperplane. However, notice that if we decrease b but keep w the same, then fewer points may get assigned to the green class because fewer of them will get a score of w transpose x plus b greater than zero, which means decreasing the bias makes the model more picky, more choosy about classifying points as green. The exact opposite will happen if we increase b. The model will then get more choosy or more picky and will assign fewer points to the red class instead. Also as before, Keeping the bias parameter the same but changing w will rotate the hyperplane. Now, as we will see in future discussions, machine learning algorithms are sometimes simpler if we do not have a bias term. However, many applications do need a bias term. For example, if we recall the application of predicting the salary of a person, the bias term in that linear model denoted the minimum wage. And if we don't have a bias term at all, then we would be forcing the model to use a zero minimum wage, which might not be nice. So what is often done is to hide the bias term inside the w vector itself. So what is done is we take the original feature vector and add a new dimension to it, which is filled with one. Let's call this new feature vector x tilde. Note that x tilde is d plus one dimensional and so must be the model now. We go ahead and learn a d plus one dimensional linear model, let's say w tilde, but without a bias term. Now let's collect the first d coordinates of this new model into a new vector that we call w. Then we will see that the dot product of w tilde and x tilde is simply the dot product of w and x plus w d plus one, which means that the last coordinate of our new d plus one dimensional linear model effectively acts as a bias term for us. This trick is often used to simplify machine learning algorithms while still effectively having a bias term.
Now at this point it would be good to take a small break and solve these two simple questions about hyperplanes and dot products. In particular, we will prove the famous Cauchy-Schwarz inequality that gives us an upper bound on the dot products of any two vectors. Now before we wrap up for today, I thought it would be interesting to introduce you to the concept of convexity. Let us start with the notion of convex sets. Here is an example of a convex set and a non-convex set. Can you guess what makes the first one convex and the second one non-convex? Both regions seem to have a smooth boundary, so that can't be the difference. But notice that one of them seems to have an inward bulge, whereas the other one seems to bulge outward in all directions. And yes, this is really the key difference here. Convex sets are those that always bulge outward and don't have any inward dents or bulges. However, this intuition can be made more concrete by using the language of vectors. We call a set convex if it contains all chords or line segments that join two points inside that set. Let's look at this more formally. Given two points x and y, you can verify that the line segment joining these two points is simply the set of all points z that can be written as lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y where lambda is a scalar taking values between 0 and 1. Thus, a set is convex if for any two points x and y inside that set, all such points z are also inside that set. Note that this definition holds not just in 2D but also in higher dimensions. A non-convex set might contain some of its line segments but that does not make it convex. If a set fails to contain even one of its line segments, we call that set non-convex. From convex shapes, we now move on to convex functions. Here are two functions, one of which is convex and the other non-convex. Pause this video and see if you can guess which one is which. If you guessed that the left one is convex and the right one is non-convex, then you are correct. A function is called convex if the region found out by filling up the space above the function curve is convex. This definition holds true in 2D as well as higher dimensions. However, there is an alternate definition too. A function is called convex if it lies below all its chords. The mathematical way of writing this requirement is as follows. Take any two points x and y and combine them in the ratio lambda and 1 minus lambda or lambda between 0 and 1 to get a point z on the line segment joining x and y. We now combine the function values at x and y in the same ratio as well. A function is convex if the function value at z is always less than the combined function value. Visually, this means exactly what we wanted that a function never exceeds any of its chords. A function is called non-convex if it violates this requirement in at least one case. There are several ways that make it easy to check whether a function is convex or not instead of doing the calculations from scratch. For example, all constant functions are convex, all linear functions are convex, the sum of two convex functions is always convex. Positive multiples of convex functions are always convex. Combining a convex function with a convex non-decreasing function always gives us a convex function. Some of the norms that we saw, for example the Euclidean norm, the L2 norm or the L1 norm are also convex functions. You can try proving some of these results yourselves from first principles as an exercise. It would also be nice if you could take some time to solve these exercises to really hone your skills at showing convexity of functions sets. So today we saw that vectors offer a very very rich language to express features and outputs of machine learning models. They can be seen as an ordered list of numbers or as an object in a vector space with a length and a direction. They can be scaled, added, subtracted together. There exist norms that allow us to calculate the lengths of these vectors. There are metrics that allow us to calculate distances between two points. 
and the dot product allows us to calculate the angle between two vectors. We also saw that norms and dot products are very widely used in machine learning to create classified models. Finally, we were introduced to the concept of convex sets and convex functions, which we will explore more in future discussions. So this is a good place to stop for today. Stay marvelous and I will chat with you next time.